We're here in the Valley of the Heart's Delight. Well, now it's known as Silicon Valley. We're Sonia Lowe of Freshbox Farms. Now you're bringing a different take to growing food. Why don't you tell us about your modular approach to, uh, to creating new food supply? So um, we believe in uh, distributed agriculture as one of the pillars of sustainability. And uh, our take on it is that Modular contains uh, risk because you're growing in modules. And um, we've uh, been the first people in the United States to put 15 shipping containers inside a warehouse. And we now grow food, and we have been growing food for the last 18 months. Uh, we're the largest modular grower in the US now. And we will continue to expand. Our current facility is expanding a further 70% from our original footprint because of increased demand. So what sort of food are you growing in these containers? We're growing leafy greens at the moment. Uh, so we're growing lettuces and spinach, arugula, baby chard, baby kale. Um, but we have grown things as esoteric as moringa, which is a high protein African shrub. Now, one of the things that is really neat about this is you're bringing the growing close to where it, the food's actually eaten, right? That's absolutely right. So we grow uh, within what's now known in the food industry as hyper-local radiuses. So within 100 miles um, from the point of production to the point of consumption. And so these containers, are they truly containers that uh, you'd find on a shipping uh, dock? Yes, they are truly shipping containers. We buy them used and then we refurbish them. And um, that is uh, that may be part of our solution going forward, but what, we what we've discovered is that the height of the shipping container is actually a constraint to further efficiency. So we're going to stay modular, but we're not necessarily going to use the shipping container format. So it needs more height, is that what you're saying? Yes, it needs more height. So what sort of technology actually goes into one of these containers to make all this work? So some of it is basic off-the-shelf hydroponic technology. It's tubs and trays and pumps um, and, you know, but what we've layered on top of that is a sort of major systems integration exercise where we've added our own automated nutrients. We've added uh, things like sensor systems. Um, so we've layered onto the basic growing infrastructure a lot of intelligence. Well, it sounds like this thing is an internet of container. It sounds like it's a big connected thing. Is that right? It is. Uh, and the containers themselves are also networked. So we have a central network uh, analysis capability where we can look at each container and understand whether or not it's performing optimally. And so what does that mean from a, a personnel perspective? Do you need a, a chief uh, technician grower or something? Or what, what sort of people do you need to, to maintain these things? Well, we have uh, sort of plant people, plant biologists, and then we have a typical software engineer, and then we have hardware people. And one of the first things I did when I stepped in as CEO was actually to split the CTO function into somebody who was going to be responsible for the plants, i.e. the software, the true software of the business, and somebody who's going to be responsible for the physical platform. And he actually manages the analytical software side as well. So from the actual going out and maintaining these things, you know, do you have people who pick the fruit how does, or the lettuce, how does that work? Uh, yes, we have harvest workers, um, farm workers basically, but they too tend to come from plant biology backgrounds. And I assume they know when they have to pick, right? Well, the plants tell us when they have to be picked. Um, I mean, that's the whole point of layering on all of this intelligence is that we can forecast uh, pretty accurately when something can be harvested. And you can harvest 365 days a year, I assume, because you're in these containers, right? Well, not only can we harvest 365 days a year, but we've radically compressed the growing cycle. So to grow a head of lettuce in the field takes something between 65 and 90 days. We can grow a head of lettuce between 18 to 21 days. We've actually grown a head of lettuce in as fast as five and a half days. And it still tastes as good as that head of lettuce you'd find in 65 days? It tastes much better actually because it um, you know when plants are outside in the sun they actually have to fight a lot of the elements and inside one of the containers you know we're nurturing them perfectly the other thing is we don't have to spray them with anything there's no chemical intervention that needs to occur because again we've created the perfect environment for them so we're mechanically nurturing them in an optimal way and so we know when they're sort of at peak harvestability 
and they're not having to fight the elements inside the container. And I imagine your yield's much better than the outside. Our yield is phenomenal. So um, when you take a thousand heads of lettuce and you plant them in a field, your edible yield that actually gets to a supermarket shelf is about 280 heads. When we plant a thousand heads, we get 995. Wow, that's incredible. So that gives you an efficiency. Um, from a cost perspective, I assume you have some costs like electricity and stuff that, uh, and broadband connections that others wouldn't. That's right. So at the moment, we are probably, I mean, the industry as a whole uh, has electricity as its biggest cost component. And um, we've been driving down costs pretty radically over the last two years. So our first unit cost $380,000. Uh, the next 10 units cost us 144, the next five units cost us 56, and now we're down to below 43. Wow, and I imagine from an efficiency standpoint as far as the density, how many heads of lettuce you can get on an acre of land is a lot more than traditional. Uh, a lot more. So within one of our 40 by 8 foot containers, we can grow, depending on the crop that we're growing, somewhere between 2 to 19 acres worth of food. That's incredible. And so from a, um, a cost standpoint, from an end cost standpoint, is it competitive with what you'd find in traditional methods? Absolutely. So when we sell to a supermarket, we are exactly the same cost to a consumer as they're buying organic uh, lettuces. But I think one of the big differences is you can make it local, right? Uh, the big difference is that we can make it local. So I stood in a supermarket last year uh, in the dead of winter in the middle of Snowmageddon in Boston, you know, sort of 10 foot snow banks, right? And I was the salad lady handing out cups of salad on a freezing Saturday morning. Needless to say, I wasn't that popular. People were sort of like, I don't want to eat salad at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. And I would say to them, it was harvested yesterday. And then people would stop and they would say, how is that even possible? You couldn't even fly it in. And the answer is, well, we're going down the road. Here are our shipping containers. Here's some pictures. And then people tasted it. And the uniform reaction was, oh my gosh, you know, this tastes like I just picked it out of my summer garden. As and that matters. So from a uh, location standpoint, where are you putting the containers? So we are uh, 25 miles southwest of Boston right now, and um, the intention is to follow that sort of footprint, is to be in the suburbs of major metro areas within that critical 50 to 100 mile radius. Do you see using uh, parking garages and things that maybe will become uh, empty buildings with self-driving cars and so forth, but using those kind of buildings? Isn't that interesting? Um, so a uniform warehouse format matters a lot to us. Uh, our first farm was in a building in the shape of Oklahoma. Don't ever do that, <laughs> right? Oklahoma-shaped buildings, slightly awkward. <laughs> but you know, uniform warehouse space that's kind of a uniform rectangle or a uniform square, very useful to us. And those exist all over the United States. I'd imagine uh, the big thing you need is just a power, probably power, and uh, anything else? You need to have industrial grade power. You need to have food grade floors. So we went in and we sealed the floor, for example. Um, you need to have uh, food grade seed ceilings, um, just so that nothing drops onto the food as it's being harvested and packed. Because we also do our own packing. Okay. So one of the things that I think is interesting from a longevity standpoint is your investor. And, and I don't know if you can talk about that, but I think it's fascinating their background. Uh, so we have several very large investors, and one of them in particular is well-versed in agriculture. They are um, the second largest agricultural landholder in their country of origin in Europe. That's, uh, that's a big stamp of approval, I would think, for this kind of approach. Well, we had some pretty rigorous, you know, tire kicking when we looked at the investment initially, which is, hey, you know, does this measure up against traditional agriculture? And what do you see going forward as far as different kinds of foods that you might be able to grow in these places? We can pretty much grow anything. Um, I mean, we tried the Moringa shrub because we wanted to prove that we could grow something other than sort of a root-based plant. Um, we've grown tomatoes, we've grown cucumbers, we've grown watermelons. Um, you know, you can grow vine fruit. Uh, we've looked at grapes. And so as we look out across our growth trajectory, we have picked four or five different categories that are high value, that benefit from being close to the consumer, and that we can grow on a more effective basis than field-based growing. 
And so do you see expanding beyond your current location then to other locales? Absolutely. So our intention right now is to have 25 what we call hyper farms, which will have 200 container equivalents inside them um, across the United States, and then a further 100 to 150 standard size farms, which will have 50 container equivalents. Wow, that's, that's quite an expansion. Well, Sonia, I really appreciate your, uh, your You're time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Very nice to meet you.